So you all have already seen um, Ido's um, bio on, in, your, in your package, but Ido Sareg is the VP and GM of IoT at Wind River, uh, which is an amazing M2M company. Uh, it's an Intel company. Intel acquired them a few years back. Um, Ido comes with a lot of experience, both on the product side as well as on the biz dev sales and um, that function as well. Plus, he's been an investor and a VC. So I'll let him tell you more about his vision for how do you take a product from the minimum viable to a full-blown product. So how do you create a product out of innovation, really? So I'll let uh, you know, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. So man, this is the last time I'm going after John, because that's, <laughs> that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> and I know that we should have done it the other way around. I'd have warmed them up for you, and then you could, give, you could have given them the stand-up uh, routine. You have a, a second career in you, believe me. Um, I'm not as funny as John. I'm uh, very straight-laced, and probably the question you're asking yourselves now, even after that introduction by Ramesh, is who are you and why should I even care? I'm not this well-known uh, VC from uh, Sequoia or Excel, and I'm not a household innovator from Silicon Valley like Jobs, uh, and I'm not even a stand-up comedian like John, so who am I? I'll spend a few minutes just giving you a little bit of my background. I spent most of my professional career with a company called Mercury Interactive. Uh, it's an enterprise software company that, I don't want to say invented, but certainly uh, made uh, automated software testing a household name for many other software companies. I was a very early employee over there. I was employee number 13. You often hear stories about Silicon, company, Silicon Valley companies that started in a garage. We did not quite actually start in a garage and we weren't in Silicon Valley, but we did start in an actual residential building, small cottage, two floors, and the garage was the server room. So we did have a garage in that story. I went through multiple roles at that company, started out as an engineer. So yes, I can be a little bit dangerous. I know just enough. Um, then moved on to engineering management, did various roles in corporate marketing, in business development, in alliances. Um, my last three years with the company, I was with our corporate development organization doing M&A work. Um, I acquired uh, six different companies for Mercury, ranging from a small eight-person startup um, that we bought for about a million and change, all the way up to a 200-person company called Quintana um, that went for 225 and took Mercury into a completely new space. All in all, I spent about 14 years there, and here in the Valley, that's often viewed as a negative. It's when I came back, came for interviews after that, it was, what's wrong with you? Why did you spend so much time at that one company? Aren't you good at anything else? And I really thought long and hard about it, and I realized, yes, I spent a long time at that company, but it was a different company all along. When I started, we were 15 people working out of a garage. By the time I left, we were 2,400 people, a public company, with three distinct business units, all growing at a fast pace, selling at a revenue rate of about $500 million a year. And shortly after I left, the company was actually sold to HP, that little company that also started in a garage, uh, for about $4.5 billion. So that was quite a ride, and I did different roles there. So yes, it was all under the same umbrella, but it was different companies. After I left Mercury, I decided to move over to the dark side, try my hand at venture investing. I was uh, recruited uh, to be a venture partner at Thomas Weisel Venture Partners, which was a $250 million uh, early stage fund. Did investment across the board. Um, the only things we didn't do, we didn't do biotech and we didn't do clean tech, but we did within high tech, everything, systems and chips, enterprise software, innovative stuff like uh, um, a company that would automate the taking of the orders at drive-in fast food restaurants so that the order taker um, that you drive to the drive-in window does not actually reside in that same fast food shop but might be completely offshored in India taking orders for 15 different franchises in the same uh, company. 
I served on the board of, uh, as a board member, as an observer of six of our portfolio uh, companies, actually four of our portfolio companies and two additional ones that I did as an independent board member. And as you can imagine, as a venture capitalist for about four years, I looked at hundreds of business plans, interviewed hundreds of companies, saw a lot of ideas, very good ones and not so good ones too. And since then, um, our fund actually didn't last all that long. Um, it was um, trying, to re, uh, trying to raise money for a second fund in 2008, which was yet another time when a big crater opened up here in Silicon Valley. Maybe not the same dimensions as the one that happened in 2001, but certainly for the venture industry, it was uh, quite, as, qu quite as catastrophic. A lot of funds didn't make it through that uh, phase, including ours. We were a, a decent fund, nothing bad about it, but for a first time fund with only a so-so track record, we couldn't get the second fund raised. So I went back into operations. I did a number of C-level roles as a CMO at startups like BDNA and Replay Solutions. And today I am, as Ramesh mentioned, the general manager of Wind River's uh, IoT Solutions Group. Wind River sits right up here on the second floor. Uh, if you know us, we've been around for about 30 years. Primarily, you know us as a manufacturer of real-time operating systems. VxWorks is the flagship product that runs everything from uh, BMW's first-generation iDrive to the operating system that's in the Curiosity uh, Mars rover that landed a couple of years ago. Um, and in my spare time, I'm also an entrepreneur. I don't have a whole lot of spare time, but weekends and so on, me and a colleague started a company called Safe Social which helps parents keep track of what their kids are doing on social media, like uh, Facebook and Instagram, without being too intrusive, without uh, having the kids be embarrassed about the, par the parents that are tracking them by being their friend and so on. And the only reason I bring that up um, is because I'm gonna be using Safe Social as an example for some of the concepts that I'm gonna talk about. Other than that, I've been a, uh, an advisor to a whole number of, uh, a large number of early stage startups, primarily in the areas of product strategy, pricing, and so on. Many of these are not well-known names, but some of them you may rec might recognize. Cyvera, for example, was acquired by Palo Alto Networks, a uh, big security company, just earlier this year for about $150 million. Um, Business Signatures was acquired by Entrust, also in the security space. Buzzgain, which was a do-it-yourself PR company, got sold to the Meltwater Group. And for the rest of them, I still have high hopes. So, what I want to do today is talk about taking a concept from idea phase through MVP all the way to the whole product. And the first thing I want to get out of the way is the notions that ideas are worth something. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Ideas by themselves are nearly worthless. And you know, you don't have to just take it from me. They're very well-known people. Uh, Derek uh, Sivers is a very well-known speaker on uh, TED, gives many speeches, also an entrepreneur in his own right. He sold a, a company called CD Baby um, for about $22 million. And this is um, one of his famous sayings, ideas are just a multiplier of execution. Execution is important, ideas themselves are not. You can have the best idea in the world, but if you're unable to execute on it, you're lousy at execution, it's worth a buck. If you have a so-so idea, it doesn't strike people as, wow, I could go for that, but you've got brilliant execution, that's a $10 million company right there. In there. When you talk to Silicon Valley VCs, um, different firms have different, fo they will tell you they place different emphasis, different focus on different aspects of your company. Some value first and foremost the team. What can this team do for me? Some value the market that you're in. Some are really uh, enchanted by the, by the technology. But all three of these things, in the end, all revolve on execution. When people say, I like the team, what do they mean? They mean this is a team that in the past has proven that they can execute. They can make money, they can sell the company. When they focus on market, what they mean is, we believe that there's an opportunity to execute this idea in this market. The timing is right, the opportunity is right. And the same holds true for technology. It's all in the execution. And I think something that might be very relevant for you guys, especially, 
coming as you are from halfway across the world, the team aspect is crucial. Out here, nobody knows who you are. You haven't done it before. So the ability of investors, partners, customers to trust you, to trust you to execute, it's a challenge. It requires a leap of faith unless you can build up a team made up of advisor, board members that can fill in that aspect. So I want to go across two concepts today, the MVP and the whole product, and I'm going to base them on books that by now are, uh, are or should be classics. The first one is The Lean Startup, uh, a recent, a recent classic that Eric Ries wrote, and then I'm going to move on to a book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. And I hope that you're at least vaguely familiar with these concepts. And I'll start with the MVP. What is the MVP concept? Eric Ries is an entrepreneur in his own right. I think he wrote the book after his experience at uh, IMView, uh, one of the companies that didn't start out all that well. And he set out to answer for himself, first and foremost, the question of, why is it that most companies don't execute well? We all supposedly know how to do these things. We've got great ideas, we've assembled a great team, we go out and we build a product, the product works, and still less than 10% of startups actually make it. Why is that? What are we doing wrong? And what Eric came up with is that what we're doing wrong is that we're trying to build a product, in most cases, that we think people want without testing if people really want it. The problem is when you're starting out with a great idea and you're turning it into a product, there's a whole host of features that you could put into it, but you have limited resources, limited time, limited money. What do you do? Most companies fail because they start out in one of two bad paths. Path number one, they're gonna build all the possible features into the product. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of resources. By the time they reach the market, they've lost their window of opportunity because they're late, because they took so long building all these, uh, all these uh, features. And in many cases, you know what? Those hundreds of features that they put in, none of them are the ones that people really wanted. So they wasted the entire time. But even if they hit on the right one, they spent so much time and resources building the 90% of stuff that people don't want, that they've lost their uh, window of opportunity. So the most important concept of MVP is don't build it until you're sure that people want it. You don't need to spend resources actually building the full product, build something that will enable people to tell you whether or not they want it or not. It's not a totally new concept. Steve Blank, another very well-known uh, entrepreneur here in the Valley, came up with a concept of a minimal feature set uh, a few years ago, which is very similar. Common theme to both of those is you build something that's small enough to enable you to measure, and John, hit upon some of the aspects of this in his presentation. You want to measure and you want to measure the right things so that you can improve your product. And going through this rapid cycle of building something small, measuring the results, learning from your mistakes, quickly iterating and doing another revision, that's the path to success. Another key aspect of the MVP is something called manualation or flintstoning. I'll explain those terms. Um, I actually came, up, came across flintstoning just a few months ago. It's a wonderful example. Do you know the Flintstones uh, uh, cartoon? For those of you who don't know, yes. Oh, I didn't even say what MVP is. MVP stands for Minimal Viable Product. Okay? All uh, three aspects are important here. Minimal, meaning you don't waste resources building the stuff that you don't need for your learning process. I'm not even talking about building stuff that uh, are not gonna make it into the final product. You only build what's needed to learn for the next step. The V is just as important, viable. We're not just putting out something there that people can't make any use of. It's gotta be a small enough set for you to learn, but a large enough set for people to actually get something done with it. And then it's gotta be a product. And I'm gonna give some examples later on. So back to uh, Flintstoning. So Flintstones is a um, cartoon, it was made popular in the 70s. It's about, um, it's set in the Stone Age, right? Uh, but it uses a lot of uh, uh, anachronisms to put modern day technology as if it were in the Stone Age. Now obviously uh, it's pre-industrial revolution, so electricity hasn't been invented yet. The uh, internal combustion engine hasn't been invented yet, so you can't have a car, 
but you can have the concept of a car, two wheels, and you flintstone it by moving your feet very quickly, and then the car, you gather enough momentum, and the car rolls enough. It's a wonderful example of an MVP. The idea here is, what if I could take a couple of wheels, connect them together alongside with a seating area, and give the car enough propulsion so that it becomes easy for it to move on its own. I want to see if people like that idea, and only if they like that, I that idea, I'll figure out how to get rid of the manual work, of the <laughs> rapid steps, and I'll put in some automation there. And the similar concept is manualation. It's that we will only put in the effort required to code something, or to build something together in the physical world, after we know that this is something that people will want and it's worth the, worth the investment. I'll give some examples of that as well. So critical to the MVP concept is the cycle of build, measure, and learn. I start with an idea, but I don't go out and rush and build out that complete idea. I build something small that will help me validate in the real world whether or not people will want it. I build a small product and I build in capabilities that will enable me to measure the response to it. I invest time, not in features, but in measurement capabilities about the features that are already in there. And then I collect the data, and then I have a learning phase. People didn't like this feature. People didn't use this as much. People used a whole lot of this feature, which I didn't even think about. Or people wrote me some comments that they would really like it if I had this piece in there, which I didn't even think about. And one of the things to remember is, and Eric Ries says it very well, he says 99% of the offers that sound great to the entrepreneur are horrible, horrible offers. Nobody ever is gonna want them. But you don't know that until you put your product in the marketplace and get that feedback directly from them. So let's, use, let's take a look at a few examples. How many of you know of Groupon, the company Groupon? Not gonna talk about whether or not it's a good company, a bad company. What is indisputable is that they had a very good IPO. They made a lot of money for their uh, founders and for their initial investors. And so in this context, it is a good company. You know what their MVP was? They didn't go out and build the entire product with a complex website. They took WordPress. WordPress is a blogging platform that is also a fairly decent content management uh, application that you can build a lot of good stuff on it. It's uh, open source, don't have to pay for it. You can very quickly try different designs on it. They took that, and on that blog, on their WordPress blog, they would advertise their coupons for the week. Would you like this offer? Uh, a couple's massage at half price. And every time somebody responded to that offer, they went to a little computer on the side, and in FrameMaker, hand-built a coupon for that, cut the coupon with a pair of scissors, and mailed it to them. That was the MVP to see if people would like the concept of group buying of coupons to get a nice discount, and it worked. For most web applications where the technology is not all that difficult, the MVP can be as simple as a landing page. I make you the offer. It's just a website. It says, would you like to buy this product once, it, once it's available? And you <coughs> fill in your name and you say, yes, I want it, or yes, I want it, but I want it in blue. And that's all you need for the MVP, because for most web applications, the actual coding behind it is not that complex. And at small scale, like Groupon showed, many back-end processes can be manulated. You don't have to code it. Uh, typical example is, somebody comes up with a bright idea of, let's offer every new, uh, Every new bank customer who signs up for online banking, let's offer them a toaster, and as soon as they sign up, we'll go through the back office, it'll connect to our SAP system, it will take, uh, it'll place an order for, for a toaster, it will go from there to uh, shipping and receiving, there will automatically be generated a shipping label, everything will be automated. But you don't have to do that, because you don't know if people will respond to that offer. All you have to do is buy 10 toasters in Walmart, and have one of the uh, summer interns Go and fill that manually, fill that order manually every time somebody accepts the offer. And if you see a nice uh, uptick, orders for uh, new or online registrations for the online banking gone up 50% since we made the offer, then you automate it. I said I'll use some of my own personal experience to explain these concepts of MVP. So let's take a look at Safe Social. Um, 
what this application does is it allows parents to see what their kids are doing online, on Facebook, on Instagram, pretty soon on Twitter, Snapchat. Um, the idea is that this is not some big brother spying application that the parents put on the kid's uh, cell phone or laptop without their knowledge. It's done with the child's consent. The child says, yes, I want to be protected. I will give my parents permission to do that. And the advantage it has over having the parent become your friend is that as far as your friends, your real friends know, your parents are not involved. So there's no embarrassment, they feel free and so on. So we went and we implemented this concept for Facebook and it took a lot of time. And then we, and we didn't get so much, uh, so much traction. Safe Social, by the way, don't get me wrong, is not some great success story that uh, it's still a work in progress and there's more, more to be done than we've already done. It's, it's far away from being a successful product yet, but there are important lessons learned there. So then when we were about to add the third, the third uh, application, we started debating what should we do? Should we do Snapchat? Should we do Twitter? Should we do uh, WhatsApp? There's all sorts of options. Without the MVP approach, I'd go and I'd, we'd go and we'd spend, you know, several weekends worth of work implementing it for Twitter, implementing it for Snapchat, implementing it for uh, WhatsApp, and getting no uptick whatsoever. Instead, what we did, learning the lessons from Facebook and Instagram, we took a quick look at the architecture of Twitter, the way they do the authentication. We figured out, all right, you know what? It's very similar to Instagram. So if somebody wants it, I'll be able to implement it very quickly. So I won't implement it from now. Instead, when somebody signs up for Twitter right now, this is what they get. They get an email that says, Twitter support is coming. We will let you know once it's available. We've already got his details because he's registered. So I've got the important piece of information. Plus, on the back end, it sends us an email saying, hey, somebody registered. There's interest in Twitter. And that's stored in the database. Remember what I said about measuring? And I now have a lot of data that I can work with. Not only the raw count of people who are interested in Twitter uh, versus Snapchat to help me prioritize what to do next, but also maybe some interesting correlations. People who chose Instagram always chose uh, Twitter. Or people who chose Facebook never chose anything else. These are all important insights into our future product direction. All right, second concept of MVP is experimentation. You don't know what's gonna work, so you've gotta try it out. So here's an interesting experiment that we tried at, at Safe Social. One of the issues we had is, as I said, the child needs to accept the request to let the parent monitor him. And it's a very complex process, and if you know anything about web applications, every time you make people go through an additional step, you lose about 50% of your funnel. And we were having an issue with getting kids to accept uh, that request. The request would go out to them via email or via Facebook message, and it would say, your parent, and we have the parent name, John Smith, wants to monitor you on Facebook. Please give him permission. And nobody was accepting that. I mean, which, what kid would do that? The only people who would sign up were the people who would stand over their kid's shoulder and say, click that right now, or better yet, they would do it in their child's name because they already knew the kid's username and password. So one experiment we wanted to try was, will kids respond well to bribery? Right? Bribery always works. Maybe if we gave them something worthwhile, they'll be more inclined to do this. So we went back and forth on what we could offer as far as bribery. Um, we couldn't offer money because uh, it's kids. Uh, plus, it also immediately goes to our bottom line. Um, Facebook credits were one thing. My partner went to a, uh, a kid's event and he saw that somebody was handing out um, these cards, these coupons that allow kids to download MP3 songs. And he said, well, that's something that kids like, especially in our age demographic of kind of tweens, kids in fifth grade and higher. And he found that the company that made those coupons was called Amplified and he was all over me. Let's go and do, do a deal with Amplified and let's start, you know, whenever a parent registers, we'll send an email to the kid and we'll give him a coupon. And, and I said, well, it's a great idea, but let's experiment first with manualation. There's no need to do this right off the bat. And instead of doing all the integration, what I did is I saw that Amazon allows you to buy gift cards in any denomination that you want, including as low as $1.29, which is the price of most MP3 kids, uh, most MP3 songs. You didn't need to do a big upfront purchase, which is what, after I talked, I 
did make a call into this company Amplified, and they said, yeah, of course, we've got an API that supports this. Um, you know, just write it, you know, you have to use this adapter and this library, which we don't have, um, and convert it from this format to this other format. And by the way, you have to do a pre-purchase of at least a thousand songs to make use of the library. So I said, instead, let's buy on-demand gift cards in the denomination of $1.29. And we'll send the email to the kid saying, please accept your parents' requ uh, request. And once you accept it, I will give you this, um, this uh, free song. And no, no upfront commitment in terms of buying the, the gift cards because I could do manualation. If somebody actually did it, I'd run over to Amazon and I'd print the card for him. I didn't have to engage with third parties. I didn't have to code anything. And in the end, it showed it doesn't really work. So lesson learned. Without spending a whole lot of money, without spending a lot, a lot of time on effort, at least in this aspect, bribery doesn't work. So that's all very nice for a web application like Safe Social, but what about the real world? I saw in your bios that many of you are working on physical things. Physical, I can't just put a website there. Have an example from Wind River, um, where I work right now in IoT. One of the uh, products that we're working on is uh, an edge management system, a web-based system that will enable you to remotely manage devices. And our premise is that there is demand, unmet demand in the market for a great user experience, for an easy to use product, a great out of the box experience, some with something that will enable me um, to take a physical board, connect it to the cloud and start writing interesting applications very quickly in a user friendly way. So the traditional enterprise way of tackling something like that is, okay, let's go out and build that product and see if it works. Instead, we took the approach of doing a little prototyping kit very low cost hardware. Our target was to have the uh, bomb about $100 or so and work in small batches. Um, we made only about 120 of these uh, kits and instead invest really heavily in the things that we wanted to test out. So we really invested in making it very, very easy to use. The goal was to have our CEO do everything from opening the box, powering up the board and downloading a Hello World application in under 10 minutes. That was the goal. And where we really invested in is in measurement features. Again, going back to you can't improve what you don't measure. So what we measured was, or the features that we built in order to measure was, um, how many of these boards were actually brought up and powered on? Once they were powered on, how often were people using it? And very key metric, what was the, when was the last time it was used? All these generate on the back end an Excel, uh, an Excel report that is emailed to management to let them know um, how the kit is used. That's what it looks like, by the way. All told, an experiment that cost us $15,000. Um, we learned a lot from it. Tiny check. I'm fine? Okay. So, we've built the MVP. We've learned our lessons. We went through the cycle a couple of times. Now we have a product that the market works, wants. Everything should be hunky-dory, right? We, if we made it past this phase, we should be golden. Unfortunately, not so. And this is where crossing the chasm comes in. This book is a marketing classic. The first edition of this book came out in 1995. That's like the ice age. That was before the internet. But the insights that it provides were there. It was before the internet. Really, I read this book before the internet existed, or at least before the internet was popular. <laughs> before the internet as we knew, know it today. Um, what was the major insight of this book? Prior to the, prior to the uh, release of this book, all technology companies were following uh, a model that said, this is the technology adoption bell curve. You start out with some innovators who really like technology. You move on to the early adopters who will work with a product even though it's not perfect. You will move on to the early majority of where the mass market in, and then you move to the late majority. And then finally, there's the laggards who are slow to adopt technology. We don't even care about them because we're gonna make all of our money in the heart of the curve. That was the theory and it did not work. The reason it did not work, and this was the innovation that Jeffrey Moore came up with, with, is that there's actually a chasm, a very large gap between the first two segments, the techies and the visionaries, and the uh, mass market. And that gap is such that you can't use those early two segments as references 
for the later market. And that's where most companies fa fall and fail. The reason they don't make good, um, good references is because it's a different, completely, demo completely different demographic. Innovators love technology for technology's sake. A lot of the folks adopting the Apple products, for example, Apple could have come up today not with an iWatch. They could have come up with an eyeglass or an eye uh, walking cane or whatever, and the innovators, the technology enthusiasts, would have snapped it up because it is new for no other reason. But the fact that they exist enables us to get new products out into the market, and innovators actually do make very good references for early adopters. Early adopters or visionaries are the people who will take this product that's not perfect, but they will see the vision, they will see what they are able to do with it. They will take the iPhone, and even though it doesn't do cut and paste, they will say, I don't care about cut and paste, because here's what, what I'll be able to do with this iPhone. I'll be able to gesture my way and use my fingers as the input device instead of relying on an external keyboard. That's innovation and cut and paste will come, you'll figure it out. But the mainstream needs the whole product. The mainstream can't work like that. The mainstream will say, but it doesn't do cut and paste and I'm used to doing cut and paste. How will I do cut and paste on this thing? In order to cross the chasm, in order to cross the chasm, the key point that uh, Jeffrey Moore makes is, You've got to make a whole product, 100% of features for one segment. Because where most companies fail is, they get into this, they've gotten their product adopted by a multitude of early adopters. And now the question becomes, well, what's next? You talk to the guy who wants to use the iPhone as a remote control for the TV, you'll get one answer. You talk to the guy who wants to use the iPhone as a alternative to, um, uh, renting DVDs and watching stuff uh, on a portable DVD player, you're gonna get a different set of answers. You can't possibly please all of them, and yet most companies fail because they try to do just that. And what Jeffrey Moore said is no. In order to successfully cross the chasm, you must establish a beachhead. You must do what is counterintuitive and place all your bets in one, place all your bets on one market, all your eggs in one basket, and make a big gamble that you will succeed there. By focusing all your efforts on all the features that that particular segment needs, you will be more likely to succeed. That means not just the features, but all the supporting functions. Because if you're gonna be selling to mainstream, you can't sell it without training, you can't sell it without support, you can't sell it without an ecosystem of partners. All these things make up the whole product, and for you to succeed, you must be thinking about those as soon as you're done with your MVP. So going back to my example, what's the whole product for Safe Social? The answer is I don't know. I don't know yet. The jury's still out. We haven't had enough success. I have a few ideas. One of the elements of our application is that it alerts parents about um, inappropriate photographs. <coughs> that is a very challenging thing to do. Um, identifying um, nudity, for example, in, in photos is not an easy thing to do. There's a whole lot of false positives. Most algorithms, including the one that we use, um, are based off of uh, skin tones and the percentage of those skin tones in the overall picture. So they're usually pretty good at picking out nude photographs. They will most likely succeed in those, but they also generate a lot of false positives. A close-up of somebody's forehead. Uh, somebody posts, uh, this is a re real-life example, somebody posted to Facebook uh, a picture of his forearm with a, a bee sting as the bee was stinging him. That's picked up as well. And even things like a tractor working in a wheat field where the wheat has a lot of skin-like colors also gets picked up. So that feature right now is not working very well. And part of it is because we haven't found the entire whole product for this segment of the market, which is image-sensitive parents. So some of the ideas we have is maybe we incorporate a human element, have a panel of parents who will manually flag these because Honestly, today the only way to properly identify an inappropriate photograph is through human interaction. But if we've gotten, we get enough of these panelists, maybe we can build a database that will provide some intelligence. Um, we've also, as we were thinking about this idea, we actually found out that there's a company that does this today for a fee, and maybe we offer a premium service for those image sensitive parents, pay a little extra, and each one of the photos will first be sent to this company who will do them for like 30 cents a photo and send you back a very high quality result. Other elements of the whole, whole product solution include things like having this product endorsed by schools or by police departments. At our school, for example, in uh, 
fourth or fifth grade, there is an annual session that the Palo Alto uh, Police Department sends an officer to teach kids about online safety. Um, he, sa he doesn't officially endorse products, but he may make oblique references to products that are good in this market. So we were talking to people like him in order to get our product uh, promoted. Similarly, the whole product at Wind River, here it's much more robust because this is what we do for a living. So some of the features we had in this IoT prototyping kit, like the ease of use, we are now incorporating in, into a commercial gateway product that we are building together with our parent Intel. I said that it's very important to focus in order to cross the chasm. So we've picked out one segment, the home residential gateway market, and we're focusing on all the features that are required for that. For example, that market is very big on some application framework called Niagara or Tritium, and that requires support for the Oracle JVM, whereas we had a different JVM in our uh, product. So that helped us make product decisions about supplementing OpenJDK with Oracle JVM and then starting negotiations with Oracle around that. Um, focusing on system integrators, getting them to adopt our platform because the key to getting a complex product like this into the marketplace where security is a concern is relying on a good system integrator. We're investing in building an ODM ecosystem, having multiple such designs from different vendors targeted at different vertical markets. And we're working on the channel build out, which is one of the strong points of, uh, of Intel. So hopefully this took you all the way from idea phase through the MVP to the whole product concept. And if there are any questions and enough time, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you.